Welcome to Electrified. My name is Dylan Loomis, and in this episode, we will unpack Tesla's new battery anode, or what Tesla is referring to as Tesla Silicon. I'd like to say thank you to our newest patrons, Alex V, Josh G, and John S. Your support is greatly appreciated, and all of our other patrons as well. Now, before we get into this at all, we need to take a moment to break down the difference between silicon and silicone, as well as silica. No, they are not the same. It is not just a pronunciation like tomato tomato situation. <laughs> they literally, silicon and silicone, are as different as can be. Silicon, with no E on the end, is the chemical element with the symbol SI. Now contrast that with silicone, which is actually a synthetic polymer or a man-made polymer typically consisting of silicon, oxygen, carbon, and hydrogen. This is confused all the time in the press and the media as people think silicon and silicone are the same, they are not. To round this out, silica is a compound which consists of silicon and oxygen, which is designated as SiO2, or commonly referred to as silicon dioxide. This is also typically referred to as silica. This is one of the main constituents of sand. So let's make sure us in the Tesla community do not propagate these misnomers. With that out of the way, Tesla was seemingly keeping their technology with this new anode close to the chest on this one as they only spent about five minutes talking about this, but there is still a ton to look into. Just to be clear, Tesla has already been using silicon in their anodes in the cars that are on the roads now, but to date it's been highly engineered and expensive and these solutions to silicon problems are not scalable. The main issue being silicon volumetric expansion, which we'll cover momentarily. During a 2015 conference call, Elon told reporters, quote, it is actually as a result of improved cell chemistry. We're shifting the cell chemistry for the upgraded pack to partially use silicon in the anode. This is just a sort of a baby step in the direction of using silicon in the anode. We're still primarily using synthetic graphite, but over time, we'll be using increasing amounts of silicon in the anode." End quote. At that time, introducing silicon into automotive-grade lithium-ion cells represented a huge milestone for the EV industry at large. And of course, at the time, silicon was widely considered to be the next big thing in anode technology due to its theoretical charge capacity being roughly 10 times higher than that of a typical graphite anode. The battery legend Jeff Dawn even chimed in a bit later in 2016 saying, quote, it's a race among the battery makers to get more and more silicon in, end quote. Let's quickly listen to Elon as I really like this analogy for a cathode and anode. It's, it's tough to exactly figure out what the right analogy is to explain uh, cathode and, and anode, but a bookshelf is probably a pretty good one um, in the sense that um, you, you, need, you need a stable structure uh, to contain the ions. Um, so you want a structure that does not uh, crumble or get gooey or basically that that holds its shape in both the cathode and the anode uh, as you're moving these ions ions back and forth uh, you, you, it needs to retain its structure uh, so uh, if it doesn't retain its structure then you lose cycle life and your battery capacity drops very quickly so basically silicon can absorb more lithium ions because these two materials form an alloy with a theoretical capacity much higher than that of graphite but as mentioned, the problem to date has been volumetric expansion. It's important to note, Tesla mentioned it is indeed silicon, the most abundant element in the Earth's crust after oxygen. It stores nine times more lithium than graphite and is inexpensive. As you can see by the chart on the screen now, these have been the solutions to getting silicon in the anode to date. As you can see, it's anywhere from $6 to over $10 in terms of cost per kilowatt hour in US dollars. Now, implementing Tesla Silicon, they are introducing a step change in capability and cost at roughly $1.20 per kilowatt hour, which is anywhere from six to 10 times cheaper than the current or other methods that have been used to date. The issue with silicon in those other methods is the particles crack, they lose their energy retention, they gum up with a passivation layer or solid electrolyte interface, which I'll get into in a moment, that needs to reform as these particles expand. As Elon so eloquently put the problems, basically the cookie crumbles and gets gooey. As you can see on this slide, Tesla does mention the SEI or solid electrolyte interface. This layer is generated on the anode of lithium ion batteries during the first few charging cycles. 
Basically, lithium, a highly reactive metal, initially decomposes when it comes into contact with the electrolyte to form this solid electrolyte interface. This layer, which is roughly 30 to 50 nanometers thick, passivates, which is developing lithium chloride film on the lithium electrode, which then prevents more lithium metal being consumed by reactions with the electrolyte. As you can also see from the diagram, the SEI is very fragile and in turn reduces cycle life of the cell due to the irreversible use of that lithium and the reaction inefficiencies. As you can imagine, having a quote unquote good SEI requires a mechanical stability that will make sure it does not break with cycling and an ionic conduction that will actually allow the transport of these lithium ions between the electrodes. Now, further research still needs to be done in this space to determine how to best understand and optimize these properties, as to date, it's been a very complex and difficult problem. It's been studied extensively, but it is still one of the least understood components of the battery. So to wrap up the SEI layer rant, it is fundamental to high performance batteries and the main role is to prevent further electrolyte decomposition in order to maintain cycling abilities. This does require that the SEI layer is well adhered to the electrode material with good insulation properties and, as I mentioned, the ability to conduct lithium ions. Now, something called atomic layer deposition coatings or ALDs have actually been proven to stabilize and prevent the formation of the SEI layer. A company called Forge Nano has been developing high conductivity coatings that have indeed been found to inhibit the rate of SEI layer growth on the anode surfaces. This reduction in the SEI layer allows for retaining power density and higher cycle life. So what Tesla is doing is they're starting with the base metal or the raw metallurgical silicon. You do not need to engineer the base metal when you just design for it to expand. So part of Tesla's secret sauce with this new anode is how they coat the particles. Now it should be mentioned that this design change alone they say will increase the range of the vehicles by 20%. They also used very general terms here as they should saying things like they're stabilizing the surface through elastic ion conducting polymer coatings and a highly elastic binder and electrode design. This should make sense as they said they are just designing for the silicon to expand and they are going to use it to their advantage in a sense. And of course, using the simple silicon without a lot of the early stage manufacturing will dramatically reduce the cost. In addition to cost reductions and potentially even more important is the scalability of this approach. There's no chemical vapor deposition and no highly engineered or high capex or capital expenditure solutions. Chemical vapor deposition is basically just a manufacturing process that has been fundamental to producing many electronics to date. Basically, it's yet another complicated process that Tesla is eliminating from the manufacturing. So this right here is just a microcosm of Tesla's first principles thinking and engineering genius. So just this silicon change in the anode alone, as mentioned, will get the vehicles 20% more range and a 5% reduction in cost per kilowatt hour in terms of US dollars just from changing the anode with this new Tesla silicon. As you can see on the screen, I put in the hypothetical 20% range improvements from the EPA estimates for Tesla's vehicles today. However, I want to make it very clear, I personally do not think Tesla will be putting these Roadrunner cells and all of this new technology they're making in-house into the Model 3 or Model Y anytime soon, if at all. The reason being, Elon did mention a bifurcation of the cell technology, so for short range, medium range, and long range vehicles, they plan to use different types of cell chemistries. Basically, the Model 3 and Model Y already have best in class performance, range, and cost numbers, so putting these Roadrunner cells into those vehicles is just not necessary. It makes a lot more sense to get these cells into the Cybertruck, Semi, Model S Plaid, and the Roadster 2.0, at least to start. Now, of course, it's possible that some of these improvements in cell technology and manufacturing processes can be implemented with Panasonic at Giga Nevada, where they're supplying cells for, you know, the 3 and Y, etc. 
but we just don't know for sure. So I personally wouldn't bank on anything major changing with the three and the Y. I think this will be more for the next generation vehicles. And this makes sense, right? Tesla does not yet have a demand problem with the Model 3 or Model Y at the current prices with the current range numbers. So to completely overhaul all the systems they have in place with these new vehicles on the horizon just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But of course, hopefully they can implement some of these technologies with Panasonic. So these mass market vehicles, the 3NY, can see some range and efficiency improvements. Only time will tell. But of course, let me know what you guys think. I would love to hear your opinions on the Model 3 and Model Y and what type of technology, if any, will be going into these vehicles. Thank you guys for watching this episode. I really do hope it was informative on some level. If it was, please like the video, consider subscribing for more Tesla content. As you can see, five minutes from the battery day presentation yielded all of this information. So plenty more to come in the coming weeks and months. Hope you guys have a wonderful day and I'll see you in the next episode.